Welcome, guys, to Real Talk, episode three, where we sit in some random place in my house and talk about keyboard stuff. Part three. Today, we're going to talk about sound tests and why every single sound test is a lie. Now, obviously, this is a gross over exaggeration, and sound tests can still be used to get the idea of the tonality and general style sound-wise of a keyboard. So let's get into it. Before we get into it, actually, this video is brought to you by Dee's. Alrighty, now I've got a whole bunch of notes here and we're gonna go through each individual bit of a sound test and how uh, these individual bits all come together to create the lie. Now, before we get into it, uh, I like audio. I'm a big audio guy, but that's mostly when it comes to listening, not recording. So uh, my knowledge about audio recording is obviously not top tier. A lot of uh, the concepts I'm going to explain will be grossly oversimplified, but the point is to just get you a general idea. So let's start with the basics. So the very, very first thing that will affect the sound of a keyboard is obviously the keyboard itself. Now, uh, my community and I had come together and created a big old spreadsheet, which will be the first thing linked under the video. This spreadsheet goes through each individual part of the keyboard and how each individual part of the keyboard will affect the sound. We're talking about the material, the design, the mounting type, the type of switches, how it's looped, whether it's assembled properly, all of that. So that's essentially the very, very first bit of the lie of the sound test because in order for your keyboard to sound like a keyboard you're hearing in a sound test you would have to build it exactly the same lube it in exactly the same way with the same quantities of lube uh, use the same exact keycaps and more importantly have the general environment around the keyboard be very similar now i'm sitting here in my living room and the acoustics in my living room are completely different than the acoustics in my bedroom or in my bathtub. And essentially the, the shape and the audio treatment, the sound treatment of a particular room will make a very large difference when it comes to how you perceive certain parts of the sound. So here it's more echoey, it's more boomy. Now, obviously I'm gonna clean it up uh, when I edit the video, but when sound is given the opportunity to reflect around, it makes things sound a little bit boomy than they would be. Now, this means if you're listening to a sound test of uh, somebody that has, you know, a great studio setup, and uh, for example, they've got sound treatment everywhere and all that jazz, and you've just got a normal room, it's going to sound different. Now, the next step is how hard the person is typing. Now, within the uh, sound sign spreadsheet, first link in the description, uh, there's an explanation of how hard you type and how that affects the sound of the keyboard. If I type very, very quietly or very softly, you don't get much of the sound of the keyboard and much of the sound of the desk. If you type decently, you can hear the keyboard, you can hear a little bit of the desk. And if you type super hard, like I type, then you know uh, it'll sound deeper because you're hearing all these desk sounds. And if that desk happens to not be a deep sounding desk, if it's a hollow desk or a metal desk or something like that, then that will also affect the sound. All right. Now we've talked about all of the things before it comes to the recording of the sound itself. And when it comes to the recording of the sound itself, the simplest way to think of it is you are playing a game of telephone with 20 people. There are 20 different factors along the chain that will determine the final output sound. All right, so 
Everything going forward is essentially explaining how the game of telephone works. Now we've talked about the keyboard and the person typing on the keyboard and the room acoustics. So now let's talk about the microphones. Now there's all sorts of microphones. I'm using a shotgun microphone over there. It's different. There are microphones like this. There are microphones that have uh, digital to, uh, sorry, analog to digital converters built in. So they're USB powered or whatever. There's microphones <clears throat> that are ribbon microphones. There's dynamic, there's condenser, all sorts of microphone. The only thing you need to understand is there are many kinds and they obviously all sound different. Otherwise, everybody on earth would be using the same, you know, $3 Chinese microphone, but we don't. Uh, each microphone, no matter what it may be, has its own tonality. So the way that it takes in the sound waves and puts out an analog signal completely depends on the microphone itself. This is why, you know, some microphones cost $10,000 and some microphones you can pick up at, you know, Best Buy or Walmart for five bucks. Now, obviously not all microphones are created equal, but let's just pretend for shits and giggles that they are. So we've got a microphone here. It's got a switch on it. This is a high pass or a low shelf filter that can be turned on and off. That means there are electronics in here that will automatically cut out or reduce certain portions of the sound. And then over here, I also can turn up the gain and turn down the gain. Now this isn't a USB microphone. This is just a normal XLR microphone, but the microphone itself, in addition, to its uh, in addition to its tonality, will also edit the sound. Uh, pretty much every microphone is suited for a different thing. That's why there are microphones specifically made for instruments and microphones specifically made for voice. Uh, that's why you see you know, all the podcasters using the same microphone because that particular microphone sounds warm and boomy and makes them sound more manly, I guess. But the microphones, will process the audio themselves before even outputting a signal. A very important thing to remember. So some microphones may sound boomier and will make a keyboard sound deeper than it should be. Some microphones are a little bit tinnier and will make a keyboard sound more high pitched than it should be. And then of course, there is the proximity effect. The distance from the microphone determines how the sound sounds essentially this is why you see all those all those podcasters with their sure sm7b's trying to deep throat their mics because when you get really really close to the microphone it makes your voice even deeper that's called the proximity effect and as you move it away your voice sounds a little bit higher pitch and this is the case with any type of microphone the microphone will sound different based on the distance from the object now in the case of a keyboard the generic listening distance is about the distance from your head to your desk. So, you know, a little shy of a meter, for example, between half a meter and a meter. That's generally where we listen. However, most sound tests are not shot from that distance because of the way that microphones work. You have to find the sweet spot where the microphone can correctly capture the sound of the keyboard. But even then, Keep in mind, you've got tonality and you've got in-mic processing already happening. Now, in addition to the microphone, we talked about microphone placement. Now, my microphone here is hoisted on a boom stand. That means it's not touching the table. However, if the microphone was placed on the table or on an arm attached to the table, then any vibrations from typing on the table itself will conduct back through and essentially you'll be hearing more desk sound than you should. So mic placement and mic mounting make a big difference. You can listen to a lot of sound tests and instantly tell, oh no, the microphone is on the desk. That's not good because I don't want a desk sound test. I want a keyboard sound test. So that's all the microphones. The next bit is we've got our interface or our analog to digital converter. Cool. Now what this does is it takes an analog signal and turns it into ones and zeros. Now, obviously 
there are many, many types of interfaces. There are $100 interfaces. There are $30,000 interfaces. That means they're different. What makes them different? Tonality and accuracy. Obviously, again, this is a gross oversimplification. The main point is that interfaces will sound different because if they didn't sound different, then again, everybody would be using the same cheapest interface on earth, which we don't. So the interface will take the analog signal from the microphone and it will turn it into a file. But that file is obviously an estimation, right? It's not gonna catch everything perfectly. So there is some loss here. This is the first step of playing telephone where the microphone may sound a particular way with one interface and may sound completely different with another interface. Next step is the interface obviously connects to your computer or uh, for example, let's say you've, you've, you've got a recording device. Let's try to not break everything. So I've got a recording device here. Yeah. Here we are. So this is my recording device that I'm recording on right now. So essentially this has its own interface within it and it will also write its own files. However, it does a lot of processing, whether or not I tell it to do processing. It's trying to process out its own self noise because all electronics have some inherent noise in them. And the same thing goes for the interface. The interface will reduce its own self noise and the microphone will reduce its own self noise. The problem is if any of its self noise arc interferes with part of the keyboard sound, then that particular part of the keyboard sound is also reduced. Now, in the, uh, in, in, in the case of using an interface connected to a computer, the computer is using recording software. That recording software, again, is approximating sounds because obviously sounds are in the air, not in digital files. It's hard to get them exactly the right way. So depending on what you're using to capture in terms of software, that software is making subtle little differences and also may be cleaning up the sound without your knowledge. That means you have done nothing thus far. You haven't edited your sound, but your microphone has edited your sound. Your microphone has reduced noise. Your interface has edited your sound and your interface has reduced noise. And now your computer is doing the same thing. So this is all on the recording side. Now, the last bit of the recording side is obviously the editing. So uh, for example, not all editing is bad editing. For example, uh, loudness normalization, that's fine. But again, putting any sort of editing means that sounds here and there have to be approximated. And you could put a noise floor or we're not even talking about touching an equalizer, but by simply having very simple filters to clean sound, you have essentially changed the sound. All right, now let's say I've got my file, which is of me typing on a keyboard that's already been changed. Now I have to encode it. Here we go again. Now we're doing more approximations. It's the next step of the telephone game. So in order to get an output file from, let's say a raw file, let's say we, we recorded our audio in a raw format, for example, 32-bit float or whatever. If you're gonna upload it to YouTube or some other sharing platform, then your computer is gonna have to encode it into a format that that system understands. So in the case of uploading to a YouTube video, that means I'm you know, uploading an MP4 file or an MOV file. And your computer then and there is taking the source audio file that obviously has already been changed and encoding it and changing it even more. So that's the very, very last step of the recording. The next step is what happens between the recording and the playback, which is upload. In the case of YouTube, YouTube compresses everything. Uh, most online services compress everything. When I upload a YouTube video, that YouTube video is like 12 gigabytes or 20 gigabytes. 
but the final playback file for you guys, even though you're watching it at you know full quality, is a very, very, very small portion of that. And the way that YouTube does this is by approximating, by removing data that it deems unnecessary. That's pretty much how, you know, uh, how, uh, what's the word? How compression works. So now we've got the file and it's compressed and everything's being approximated. But let's say hypothetically, hypothetically, you've saved the, the, the source uh, raw audio and you've uploaded that uh, as a link on your YouTube video, for example, which is something I do recommend. Then that means the compression will not be approximating sounds, which is great. But now let's talk about the playback. Playback is interesting because all of, all of the steps that we've covered when it comes to recording, that being a microphone and a analog to digital converter and then uh, some sort of compression, all applies to you listening to the sound test. Now, as you get the file from YouTube or whatever, the file is decompressed by your computer or your phone or your toaster, and again, approximations are being made. Again, these, approximation, these approximations are not huge, but they exist. So the very first thing is that a digital file is being unpacked and you've got the audio stream. Now your computer or your phone will have a digital to analog converter. So the exact opposite of this. So this took an analog signal from the microphone and turned it digital, but now we need to take the digital signal from YouTube or wherever and make it analog so you can hear it. So that obviously comes with its own tonality. Uh, you may say, Simon, I, I don't have a, an, a, a digital to analog converter. Sure you do. If you have speakers or headphones or a laptop, they all need to be able to take a digital file and turn it into an analog so you can hear it. So. Right then and there, you've got the tonality of your own digital to analog converter. And then there's an additional step, which is your amplifier. The same logic goes, Simon, I don't have an amplifier. Yes, you do. Even in your little AirPods, you've got small little amplifiers in there. And that amplifier has to approximate sounds and introduce a little bit of additional noise and a little bit of tonality shift. Now, those of us that are into higher end audio, we know that different amplifiers sound different. Again, that's why there's $99 amplifiers and $50,000 amplifiers, because they sound different. And they pair differently to different headphones and different styles of music. And all of this really applies for when you're listening to a compressed or uncompressed video or audio file that you've gotten of a keyboard recording. And then the final two steps in the chain is your headphones or your speakers. So your headphones and your speakers will have their own tonality. So some headphones will sound tinnier, some will sound deeper, sound, some will sound wider, so the sound will sound like it's further away. But all of this affects the sound that you're listening to. And if your sound was not meant to be wide and your headphones or your speakers have made it wide, you have changed the core tonality of the audio. And then the absolute final step is your ears. And all of our ears work very, very differently. Uh, in general, human ears don't really work like a speaker or a microphone. Uh, if you've ever seen you know, a frequency response curve for a pair of headphones or a pair of speakers, you've probably seen it on the internet. There's actually a frequency response curve for your ears. And considering that all humans are different, our own frequency response curves for our ears are all slightly different. They peak in certain parts, uh, notably in the areas of, uh, of the frequencies where you know human speech is a thing, but also it has its subtleties where some people can hear certain things better than other people. And this means that in person, you listening to, to said keyboard will sound completely differently than a recording of said keyboard because this, will never perfectly replicate this, right? So 
That's basically the entire chain. Now I've kept it very, very simple. There's a lot more to it, but the basic concept is almost everything on the recording side has a tonality. Whenever it's uploaded, a lot of approximations are being made. And when you listen to it, everything has its own tonality. In addition to obviously the recording environment and the, the particular build of the keyboard you're listening to. So now comes the question, hey, Simon, how do you make a good sound test? That's pretty hard. That is pretty hard. Uh, in my experience, I have heard one very good sound test from Rama. And that was the sound test where everybody who listened to it was like, wow, this sounds terrible. I can hear Kate's nails touching the keycaps and I can hear the traffic outside. Yes, because in reality, when you're using a keyboard or sitting in a room, there's always noises elsewhere. Removing all those noises removes parts of the keyboard sound itself. We tend to, you know, filter it out while we're sitting around and we don't really notice all of the sounds going on, you know, outside of our immediate environment, but they are there. So uh, in the case of Rama, he was using a matched pair of uh, pencil microphones uh, that were pointed at head distance from the keyboard, perfect, and with left and right channels, perfect, just like a real recording. And this was recorded in 32-bit flow. So he gave us the raw audio file. And so far, that has been the best sound test in terms of accuracy and probably one of the worst sound tests in terms of enjoyability because either you will have an accurate sound test or you will have an enjoyable sound test. Sure, you can try and meet in the middle, but then it's no longer accurate. That is the issue that we are dealing with. Anyway, do I think sound tests should be outlawed and all sound test people should be thrown in the river? No, but it's important to understand that in order to truly replicate what a keyboard sounds like, you would need to build it exactly the same way, use it, in exactly the same way, placed in the same exact room, recorded with the same exact equipment, encoded with the same exact computer, uploaded to the same service, and then played back through, through your own uh, stereo or audio system. So the only way to have a keyboard that sounds like a keyboard online is to record it the same way and to play it back the same way. There is no way to replicate a proper sound of a keyboard in person. It's just not possible. I mean, maybe if you found like the perfect pairing microphone and interface for a particular keyboard, but it wouldn't work for every single keyboard. And that is why every sound test is a lie. Bang. All right, bonus round. So I've got some notes here. So uh, something we didn't talk about was obviously the cables. Sounds really, really stupid. Simon, how can cables affect anything? Again, there's $1 cables and there's $10,000 cables. There's a difference between them. Some say the difference is not huge, but there is a difference. And if you've got bad cables, for example, between your microphone and your interface, when you're recording it or on the playback side, if you've got bad cables between your computer and, uh, and your headset, that is going to affect the quality of the sound. Uh, something we talked about was, uh, was self noise of microphones and interfaces, but keep in mind, everything has self noise. Every electronic has self noise. That means your computer has self noise when you're, uh, when you're encoding uh, your, uh, the the uh, the uh, the device that is playing back the audio has its own self noise, and there is obviously a bunch of noise generated by AC power. So anything directly uh, connected to a power strip is going to have, or a power socket, is going to have significantly more noise than anything powered off a battery. This is something that uh, people that work in audio fully understand. Uh, we've got your USB cable. This is also cables, but a good USB cable versus a bad USB cable might affect the smallest bit of tonality in the sound when it comes to recording and when it comes to playback. What else have we got? Cables, your headphones, your ears, 
your brain and your bias. This is a good one. So your bias includes, I mean, we are all biased, even me, even you. Everybody is biased. We expect certain boards to sound a certain way. We expect expensive boards to sound better than cheaper boards. Uh, we expect things to sound good just because somebody said that they sound good. That's how biases work. And it, it's not just something to do with keyboard sound. You know, if somebody tells you, oh, this dish is amazing, you're going to think it's more amazing than it actually is because the idea has been planted in your head. So that's something to keep in mind. When, when you see a super well-presented keyboard shot very cinematically and all of that, it will sound better to you. That's why people love Teha type sound tests, and I love them too, because they look beautiful. He, he fucking nails that shit. Are they perfectly accurate? No, no sound test is perfectly accurate. All right, uh, let's see. I think that's it. We've covered all of the bonus facts. We've covered everything that you need to know about sound tests and why they are the lie that will never go away. Peace out, guys. I'll see you on the next episode.